And now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a fantastic special uh, segment that we hadn't actually thought of until just a few days ago. Now, how many of you uh, were familiar with the fact that the Rolling Stones recently created history by playing in Cuba in Havana for the very first time? Nobody? Wait, one, two people? Let's just hear a little, I can't really see you, the lights are very strong. Um, it, okay, so we're very pleased to bring onto the stage right now a gentleman who actually organized this. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring on Adam Wilkes, who is the CEO of AEG Live. AEG is the largest concert promotion company in the world. And AEG has been operating in China for a long time. Please give Adam Wilkes a big round of applause. Adam, welcome. So, okay, um, Adam, what we're going to do uh, in this session now is we're going to start off by showing a little video clip, and then we'd like you to take us through this uh, particular story. So, Ed, let's roll the first short clip. Castro's regime ban rock and roll. You ban something, you're making it a little more tasty. This is a first for them and us. Okay, so you got the sense, we set the scene, and now Adam, first of all, you're based in Shanghai, yeah. you've been living in Shanghai for the last 15 years, you've been used to dealing with some of the most difficult uh, problems in putting on concerts in China and in the region, where sometimes you have to deal with authorities that don't really respond to logic or functional uh, issues or functional logistics. Very uh, nice way to put it. So uh, here you are, living in Shanghai, you get a call from your team in Los Angeles. Give us a little bit of background as to how you, from Shanghai, were the person responsible for making the Rolling Stones work for the first time ever in Cuba. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think they, um, they were sitting in LA scratching their heads saying, who the hell's gonna be dumb enough to go down there and do that? And they said, well, what about that guy in China? You were the guy in China. I'm the guy in China. And uh, I've actually now been promoted to the, the head of communist countries for <laughs> AEG, which is a prestigious title. I have Belarus, um, Vietnam, a lot of great places. Um, and then also just generally places that nobody else wants to go. So I had the, uh, uh, the opportunity before to work with the band. I promoted them in Asia and Australia. Which venues, which, which cities? We did... Uh, we went from Abu Dhabi through Tokyo, Shanghai, Macau, Singapore, and then did a whole run through Australia. So this is with the Rolling Stones. This is with the Rolling Stones. So you've got a sense of how they worked and the enormity of taking the Rolling Stones on the road. This is not just taking a few guitars and some amplifiers. A, this it, is a big, big production. It's a big production. So there was a good, uh, a good rapport with the band and uh, experience working with them in non-traditional markets and just in general, being in China, being in Asia, putting on shows in places where things work a little bit differently. So I got the call, and they said, you know, we'd like you to just do an exploratory mission. And this is in December 2015. This was right before I was going on Christmas break with my wife and a uh, six-month-old daughter. Wow. So I... So said, let's just get the, the, the chrono chronology right here. December 2015, in February and March, the Stones are due to be touring across South America. Yeah. And then what? Well... Uh, Mick Jagger had this great idea that he wanted to take the band to somewhere that had never, they had never played and right. to do something that had never been done. Truly, truly a great vision. And he shared this with his team, with his manager Joyce, and with uh, the team at AEG that handle all the touring. And 
everybody got very excited about it and started talking, how do we do this? And then that went on for months, and we just were all talking to ourselves. And then they said, hey, Adam, you're the guy that go and sort it out. Well, then they called me and asked me what I think. And I've never promoted a show in Cuba, but nobody's promoted a show in Cuba. So I said, well, has anybody been to Cuba? Has anybody called anybody in Cuba yet? So, and, and just by the way, this is a country that for 50 years, with the embargoes by the United States on Cuba, was right out of the mainstream of anything. So close to America, but, but very, very far away. So my, my genius idea was, well, why don't we just go to Cuba? Let's go down there and, let's go down there and check it out. So uh, everybody thought that was a good idea. That's, that's Cuba there, That's right? Havana. That's Havana. Beautiful city. So you, to, to just get a sense of Havana, can you imagine a capital city, very much unlike Singapore, that just has not been built or developed or painted or anything for 50 years? It's just been, it's been frozen in time. So we, we hopped on a plane. It was myself, uh, Opie, who's the, the band's production manager, and Paul Gonger, the tour director. And we flew down there. We had no meetings booked. We had no idea really what we would do, who we would talk to. We had reached out to the British ambassador, who did help start. What did you say to him? Please help. Help. <laughs> and of course, he would want to see Sir Mick Jagger and the band. That would be a big thing for him to promote. I think he saw that as a, you know, an opportunity, and he, he was very supportive. And we definitely tapped into all of the, the expansive resources of the band and of AEG. But we get there, and it was, it was kind of funny. Almost from arrival, we started having people meet us. They were coming to find us. Really, I don't even know where these people came from, but they just sort of knew. And, and later on, months later, you know, I learned that, you know, they always know what you're doing there at all right. times. So we get there and we, you know, we start um, meeting different people and it, it ends up getting us into uh, a meeting with the Minister of Culture. And this is all happening over, literally over the course of a, of a day. And we sit down with him and his team and we give him this whole pitch of what we want to do. And he kind of looks at us and he, and, he, um, and he smiles and he says, you know, you're probably the, the 12th person over the last five years that sat here and says they represent the Rolling Stones and want to bring them to Cuba. So I'll tell you the same thing I've said to the previous 11. Um, you know, yes, we'd love to have the Rolling Stones here, but how do we know that you guys actually represent the Rolling Stones? So we had to, you know, prove our credentials and it was helpful. And you told them that you're going to be doing these dates in the rest of South America. We, we you want to do it at the end of those we dates. We explained the whole concept. We explained why the timing needed to work when it did. Uh, we explained our relationship with the band, and, and, and the British ambassador was very helpful with that. And everybody got really excited about it. And they started showing us different places we could, we could put on the show. And we really wanted to play, or Mick Jagger wanted to play in Revolutionary Plaza, which is, you know, Huge their, square. Huge square. Their red square. Their it's where Fidel square. Castro used to give his long speeches. It's where Fidel Castro gave many long speeches. And they said, no, no, you can't play there. It's only reserved for uh, political functions. It's a political arena. But this show is not about politics. This show is about music, which, which, was, which is true. And they said, we'd rather you play a different location. We have this great location for you. It's, it's right along the waterfront. It's next to the US Embassy. And it's called Anti-Imperialistic Square. And we said, <laughs> it's not political at all. So we didn't agree with that one. But we ended up finding this great site right in the center of the city called Ciudad Divertiva, which is a giant sports park in the center of the city. So Adam, when you were looking at that, 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 is, that is that the park there? That is the park once we started uh, Now, how do you up. even anticipate how many people you might be getting at the event? How do you plan for, is it 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, a mean, million? The, the reports were that there were a million. Um, I'm not even sure how they counted a million people in there. There's a lot of people in there. But Every, the point is that this is what you were given by the government. Well, we, we, we decided that was the best location because with all of the obstacles, that we were going up against, we at least needed to pick the place that logistically was going to work right. the best. And it was a large park, it was the center of the city, and, you know, Opie, as we were there throughout the course of the first couple of days, he says, you know, we're going to have to bring everything in. This is going to be like the, the U.S. military invading Iraq. And I said, Opie, no U.S. military invasion references when we speak to the Cubans. <laughs> Okay, so when you say that you've got to bring things in, the Rolling Stones, when they go out and put on a show, this is very, very sophisticated. Lighting, sound towers, delay towers, 
um, all of the backstage stuff. Give us some sense of uh, whether the, the Cuban authorities had anything that you could use there locally. Well, this, this was the band's criteria. It was, we can make all sorts of compromises. We don't care about our hotel rooms or our catering. Let's forget about all that stuff. But from a show perspective, this show needs to be a Rolling Stone show. This needs to be the show that we do in Hyde Park, the show that we would do in New York. This needs to be the full production. And we can't compromise on safety. Everything else, we could have some flexibility. And what we quickly realize is that there's, there's nothing there. So when you talk about... And when you say nothing, there is nothing there. There is nothing there. So when you talk about bringing in a production, it's not we bring it in plus we find some nuts and bolts locally. There's nothing there. So to get things there, you need a ship, you need containers, you need a 747. We had 65 sea containers that were shipped in over several different shipments. We had two 747s, and our final uh, staffing was over 450 people of which wow. about 300 of them spent uh, over a month on the ground building the show. Wow. We brought in everything. And, and there's a couple you know, uh, you know, stories to, that, that came out of that just to explain how challenging this was. The only things that we couldn't bring in were trucks to take our cargo from the port. We couldn't bring in cranes. I think we managed to get the only crane in the country. And we couldn't bring in fuel. And we, we ultimately came to this major impasse where we couldn't agree on the fuel requirements. And our production team was having these ferocious arguments with the Cuban government officials right. over fuel. And the government was saying, we need to know how much fuel you're going to use during the course of right. the build. The build was over six weeks. And our guys are saying, how do we know how much fuel we're going to use for six weeks? So they came up with an estimation. Right. And the Cubans said, no, we can't have an estimation. We need to know down to how many liters you're going to use. How many liters? And this went back and forth. And finally, it, they brought me in to, to try to, you know, a little more diplomacy, and they said, look, you have to understand that this is a state-run economy, a state-planned economy, and we have every year, every month, we only have this much fuel. And then it gets allocated to different government departments for different functions. And this event has taken place, and we've now been approved by the, the highest level of government. By the president's office. All the way up to the top. And we've been given permission to go to these other government bureaus and ask for some fuel. But when we ask for their fuel, that means that their economic output for this time period is going to decrease. Right. So if we ask for too much fuel, then we've stalled the economy. And if we ask for too little, you're not going to get any more fuel. OK, so all of this is moving towards the time continuum of having the show on March 25. Well, it was March 20th March was the 20th. first date. And March 20th was because the last show on the tour was in Mexico City, and it ended on March 17th. And this so was March 17, you'd come into uh, Havana on March 20, you'd do the show, and the band would then and leave then after And then we go on our way. And that was the date, and that was really the only date that could happen. Maybe we could have done one day earlier, one day later, but it was that date. And How much does it cost to keep the Rolling Stones on the road per day? I mean, this whole project cost, cost millions of dollars, but the operating costs for the band, for everything, was roughly about $300,000 a day. A day, okay. So you set the state for the 20th, and then, as you are now going through all of these incredible logistical nightmares, fuel problems, getting the ship in, the 747s, some surprise is foisted on you. Tell us what it is. The announcement of President Obama arrival in Cuba. 89 years, there has never been a U.S. president that set foot in, in Cuba. Cuba, and they decided to announce his arrival, which would have been 12 hours before our show. Oh. And their announcement came out two days before our announcement was going to come oh. out. And we, we get called into these emergency meetings, and everybody just was, the, the life had been taken out of us, on both sides, on the government side and our side, because the one thing in the world that was bigger than the Rolling Stones playing a free show in Cuba was the President, President of the United States. And <laughs> For the you know, first time in 89 years. Yeah, it was, it was a big one. And, you know, we were trying to come up with every idea you could imagine. And, and the Cubans, you know, at this point, we had a pretty good idea of how challenging things are there. And they said, look, you know, this is, this is not a lack of desire. It's not a lack of will. We don't have the infrastructure to do that and to do this. And these two things are too important. We can't mess it up. And, and you start to imagine all of the security requirements that go along with a, a U.S. president traveling. I mean, all sure. of that stuff is, is beyond comprehension. And everything went on hold. And, we, and they said, you know, why don't you just come back a few months later? 
Like, it's they say to you, come back a few minutes well, later. Well, not me personally, but the, No, but to the team. Because they didn't understand that the, to move an artist like this, the machine required, you know, it seemed logical. You can't just come later. And we, and right. we needed to explain that it was really, this, this is not an empty threat. This right. is either now or this is never happening. So we, we narrowed it down and we, and we arrived at, maybe we could push it back a few days. And they proposed to us March 25th. March 25th. Five days later. And it would have been right after Obama, Obama had left, and we'd have to coordinate with various security requirements so that we, you know, worked around that kind of stuff. And, and everybody got to this point. And, but the problem is March 25 is Good Friday. And so we, what, 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 why is that a problem? Well, in Latin America, pretty much all very, you know, they're, they're Catholic countries. It's a major holiday, and that was actually why the entire tour was ending a week or so before Good Friday because it's a major holiday. And they said, oh, no, that's not a problem in Cuba. Cuba only in the last several years has uh, reestablished relations with the Vatican, with the Catholic and Church. And religion freely to be practiced. Exactly. So while the church is there, it's not a holiday celebrated like it is in other parts of Latin America, Mexico, and so on. Who would have told the government that this is Good Friday? Did they get that from the Vatican? No, no, they, they know it's Good Friday. They just said it's not as big of a holiday as elsewhere. Don't worry about it. And they, right put it in writing, and then I had to go on the other side and convince the band. At that point, the tour was going to be over. They were going to be on personal holidays, so can you extend the tour? Can you extend your, uh, change your holiday schedule? Can we, wow. can we find additional money? The whole thing. And everybody finally gets to this point where it, this was too big to, to not have happen. Let's, let, let's just go forward. And you got a film crew standing by so that you could shoot this. How many, 18 cameras, a big... I mean, the whole thing, you know, the whole thing. So we, um, we move forward with March 25th. We announced the show. It's, you know, global headlines, the whole thing. Full steam ahead. Everything is going great. Until one day, um, I forget the exact date. It was about a week before the show. I get a, a phone call. It's 7 in the morning and it's the Minister of Culture. And this guy never had called me on my cell phone before. The Minister of Culture. Yeah, usually it's a formal thing and they set up a meeting and he's calling me and he sounded panicky and he said, you know, I, I gotta meet you. So I said, oh, you know, I'll get up, I'll come, I'll come to your office. He goes, no, 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 I'm coming, coming to your hotel. He gets there, I mean, it seemed like he was probably, 10 minutes later he's there and we have a meeting in this god-awful conference room that we had been using for our office and it was this narrow little room on the third floor with a little tiny window in the corner and it smelled like mold and it, the power would never right. work. And they're sitting there and they say, we don't know how else to say this to you other than just to say it. And I'm like, for God's sake, just what, say it. What do you got? Yeah. <laughs> what do you got? And he says, the Pope has called Raul Castro. <laughs> and I'm just like... <laughs> The Pope is called Raul Castro. And he asks if we could please move the concert because they didn't think it was appropriate for uh, a rock and roll band to play on such a religious holiday. So, <laughs> we want to see the to world know from a Rolling Stone point of view. Wait, hold on. Hold on there, Ed. So, um, we, um, you know, they asked if we could change the date. And I just, you know, uh, the world was spinning, and, and they said, you know, Adam, Adam, can you, please, can you please answer the question? And I said, I think if I run at full speed, I could throw myself out that window. <laughs> so that was the first meeting. Um, throughout the day, these meetings continued. So the next time they came around, same agenda. And I said, look, guys, and I had thought about a more appropriate answer. Yeah, I'll give you the cue. I said, um, you know, the Rolling Stones are a non-political organization, non-religious organization. They've had fi a 50-year career. They've never allowed religion to dictate their business decisions. They're not going to do it now. It's only rock and roll, Mr. Yeah. President. Well, that, that didn't work. The next approach I took was, I'm Jewish, for God's sake. I don't even know what this means. And they're like, no, 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 we're communists. We don't know what it means either, but we, this is the problem. <laughs> um, Finally, the last meeting, they come by my hotel, it's, you know, it's at night, we're sitting in the bar, I've had a few drinks, and they said, we have a solution. And I said, what do, you, what do you got? And they said, 12.05. 12.05 a.m. 12.05 a.m. I said, excuse me? They said, 12.05. Five minutes after midnight. 
And I said, what, what, what does that mean? And they said, well, it's not Good Friday. It's five minutes into Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> and I said, you're telling me that the Pope called Raul Castro, and this is now a global incident, and we're going to beat the Vatican on a technicality? <laughs> and they're like, technicalidad, si. Technicalidad. <laughs> and I'm like, guys, that's the, the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I said, you know, we can't do that. I said, well, what are we going to tell the media? Like, no, 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 we control the media. I said, <laughs> I said, yeah, you control your local TV station. What are you going to tell CNN? What are you going to tell the New York Times? This is global right. media. Right. That didn't really register. And I, and I said, guys, I said, you know how old, you know, look, you know how old these guys are? They don't, 12 or 5, they're in bed. Well, how they're old in, is Charlie Watts? He's 74. Yeah, I mean, Charlie Watts is in bed at 12. Charlie Watts is in bed at 10.30. There's no 12 or 5 <laughs> show. And, um, yeah, and they, they finally backed down. And we were, we were full steam ahead. And it ended up being, okay, it was, it was an absolutely incredible concert. There was hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in the audience, but it, you know, it was really so much more than that. So Adam, do you think that your Shanghai experience really at least gave you some tools to basically deal with the most illogical, unexpected obstacles that you could just barrel your way through, both as an effective executive and also being completely creative? I am a, I am a communist expert, Ralph, that's true. Um, it, it, yeah, in some ways, there was a lot of a lot of similarities. But look, in the end, you know, the event was it was so much more than just a concert. It was, you know, it, it was truly, um, you know, the power and and force of music for positive change. Right. And it was something that we, you know, all of us in this room, we started working in this industry because we love music, but then as our careers progress, it becomes so much more about business. Right. And, and this was something that was uh, very Incredible. pure and, and for music. And, and for that audience, you know, they, had, they enjoyed the show. It was a great spectacle. But for them, this was 50 years of waiting and wanting and one moment of, of hope. And it was, it was pretty uh, heavy stuff. So let's finish up this interview. I mean, it's fa fascinating. You've got to write a book about it. And of course, the film footage that you got from all of the, the cameras that were there, captured the magic of the moment. So we, let's we finish have, up. So we started, it was, that film's coming out soon, and that's called Havana Moon, and that's the live concert footage. Separately, there's a documentary that just debuted at the Toronto Film Festival this same week, and it's called Ole, 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 and it's ole, the, documentary, ole, ole. Right. the documentary of the tour, and that's what we're going to play now. Okay. Let's go to the video, please, Ed. To see the world from a Rolling Stone point of view, Nobody else sees the world the way we do. <laughs> Gentlemen, come on in. I was opening his room service. So this tour, we're going to visit nine Latin American cities. And hopefully the tenth is going to be Havana, Cuba. Please allow me to introduce myself. We're on a big show there. It's really hard, but we're going to try best to do it. Nothing has happened like this in Cuba before, ever. Pleased to meet you! Hope you get my name! Ladies and gentlemen, the Rolling Stones! It's going to be real adventure of discovery. In several countries, rock and roll was banned. Te oí esa música y se le daban presión. The minute you ban something, you're going to create a movement. ¿Cómo puedes este, parar el rock and roll? La música no tiene frontera. Los están acá, es una religión los están acá. As Cubans prepare for the arrival of the Rolling Stones, they never believe that this could happen. To break into somewhere new is an exciting chapter. Making new people is a real source of inspiration. <laughs> It's like a circus. It's a circus we've made. <laughs> it's a very emotional thing to be in the middle of that crowd. It's the same feeling as when I first joined. They're going to see something they've never seen before, and they're going to hear something they've never heard before. That's the name of the game. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Adam a great, great round of applause. What a story. What a highlight for all that matters. Adam, fantastic, man. Really incredible. Hey, Adam, you doing anything next week? 
I've got to be moving house, and I think that you can really solve all the problems. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Wilkes, please give Adam another round of applause. What a story.